continuing in Ecclesiastes. We are continuing in Ecclesiastes. So we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And one of the things that we're going to, you know, from last week what we saw was in Ecclesiastes 3, we saw that there was a time for everything, it seemed, you know, that was going on. We saw from Scripture also that God not only loves people and loves, you know, things, but he also hates things. And, he, and he, 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 there's times where God does hate people. And we saw that, um, you know, through, uh, you know, looking you know, throughout the Bible, and we just didn't take it from that one verse where we looked throughout the Bible and you know, show some of those things. Obviously not an exhaustive list of going through everything that God hates, that we should do that on our own time, because if we went through all those things, then we would be here for a while. And I know that some people probably have something in the crock pot or you want to go out to lunch or maybe take a nap sometime. So I didn't want to actually continue to do those things. But just so we understand, you know, I'm going to read Ecclesiastes chapter 4, but I want us to understand that what we're going through in Ecclesiastes is Ecclesiastes is one of the harder books of the Bible to understand. It actually is one of the harder Bible, the harder books of the Bible to understand. So that's why we need to define Scripture with Scripture. When we find something and it seems like it's contrary to God, you know, to God's Word, we need to define Scripture with Scripture. What does that mean? Well, let's say, you know, say there's an issue about salvation. Somebody was like, you know, thinking, and it seems like they're talking about salvation. Well, you go to the parts of the Bible that expressly speak about salvation, you know, what the Bible says about salvation. Or if, you know, this, or if the Bible's talking about abortion, or if the Bible's talking about suicide, or those things. You go to those areas of the Bible that show that. One of the, you know, ways, you know, that I use is, you know, I have, you know, I have computer software that kind of helps me. But another way you can do is, like, you know, concordance or something like that that you can get. Sometimes you have a reference. I actually prefer more of a reference about because a lot of them will um, line those up and say, okay, this verse goes with this verse, and it's able to help you out. But that's the reason why we need to define scripture with scripture. We can't go, you know, we shouldn't be relying upon a commentary or a, another pastor or someone to always define those things for us. If we're to study God's word on our own, we need to learn how to define scripture with scripture. Because you know what? The world cannot define God's word. They are spiritually discerned. They have no idea what God's word says. They, they want to make the word, you know, say to certain things. But that's not what it's saying. So we need to be able to define scripture because the Bible will define itself. And some people say, well, isn't that kind of like circular reasoning and that kind of what? Yes, the Bible does that. Because why? Because it knows that you're going to come across passages that you're not going to understand, that you're going to need to be able to go to an easier verse that is pretty blank, you know, blatant and clear so that way you can understand what's going on. You say, well, that sounds like a lot of hard work. Well, yep. I mean, that's the, you know, what it is. When we study the Bible, you know, if we want to understand it completely, that's what we need to do to be able to understand those things. And so, you know, like I say, uh, it's, so at times, you know, because at times in the book of Ecclesiastes, we will see King Solomon has some weird, strange thoughts at times. You know, I mean, how is, this, how is his mindset so far in this book? Vanity of vanities. Should we always be thinking about everything as meaningless, and everything is empty? Should we always have that, you know, downward look? No. Obviously, this is a man you know, who God gave wisdom to when he's telling you over and over again is vanity because a lot of things that he, he set his life out to figure out where the happiness was, he's going to tell you. It's empty in that area. It's empty in this area. It's empty. But he does take, he has some strange thoughts. So the thing is, is that, you know, he does have some strange thoughts along the way, not the entire thing, but there's times, obviously, where he gets it right, and that's the reason why we need to also define Scripture with Scripture. Because the Bible records things that how they were said. But when somebody says something like, you know, say it's you know, just a person in the Bible speaking, it's not Jesus Christ, the Bible will report what they said. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's true. Okay? Just because, because you know why? Because it's, you know it's it's being said by a believer, and a believer at you know at times can say stuff that's not necessarily true. So that's the reason why we need to define scripture, scripture, make sure that we understand everything in there, okay? And that's why you know this morning I'll be doing that in some of the harder areas of Ecclesiastes chapter four. So let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter four. The Bible reads, "So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of such." As, uh, as were the oppressed. And they had no comforter. And on the side of, of their oppressors, there, uh, there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore, I praised the dead, 
which are already dead, more than the living which are yet alive. Yea, better is he that, that, uh, than both they which hath not yet been, who have, uh, who have not uh, seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, I consider all travail and all the uh, right work that uh, for this man is envy of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The fool folds uh, his hands together and he is his own flesh. Verse 6, better is a, a handful of the quietness than both, uh, both the hands full of the travail and vexation of spirit. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, uh, he hath neither child nor uh, brother, uh, yet, uh, <clears throat> yet is there Yet there is no end of all his labor. Neither is his, uh, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith uh, he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For uh, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Uh, but uh, woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he, uh, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can uh, how can one be one, uh, one alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall uh, withstand him, and, the three, uh, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. Better is a uh, better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king. Who will no more be admonished? For out of prison he comes to reign, whereas he that is born in, uh, in his kingdom becomes poor. I consider all the living which walk under the sun, with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no, uh, no end of all the people, even of all uh, that has been before. They also that come after shall shall not rejoice in him. Surely this. This also is vanity and vexation of the Spirit. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. Lord, that your word would be as a fire shut in my bones. Lord, that you would give us ears to hear your word. God, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word as well. Lord, that we, that we should be holy as you are holy. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, the title of my sermon is Life Isn't Fair. Life isn't fair. And oftentimes you hear this from kids, you know, say, I want, you know, I want things to be fair. I want, you know, that's not fair. That's not fair. I want this. And the thing is that what almost every single parent, every single, you know, aunt and uncle, every single adult has to say to a child is what? Life isn't fair. It's not fair. And the good thing about the Bible is, is that when the Bible tells you, the Bible doesn't tell you that everything is wonderful, and, you know, that's all daisies and daffodils. It tells you that life is not fair. That it will show you over and over again, life is not fair. The only time life becomes fair is when we get to go on to glory, you know, with Jesus Christ, because then it will be a perfect world. There was a, a person this past week that you know that we were talking to, and they said, you know what? If this was a perfect world, we would. And we're talking about the fact of, of children and you know, and, and foster care and kids needing to be adopted and, and all these different things going on. And the lady, you know, she was as much as well. If it was a perfect world. And I just kind of interrupted and I said, if it was a perfect world, we wouldn't need foster care. We wouldn't need all these things. Why? You know, because it would be a perfect world because people wouldn't be doing the things that, whatever. But the thing is, it's not a perfect world. We live in a strong, wicked world in which people do stupid things and they do things to where somebody else needs to take care of, of those children or whatever. So we're, what we're going to see is that in this, uh, Solomon is just, he's can kind of continuing this area of vexation of spirit and vanity of vanities and you know all this thing you know that he ends up seeing. So in the first one it says, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comfort. And on the side of uh, their oppressors there was a power, but they had no comfort. So this is the same thing, like I said, we see throughout Solomon is the fact that, that no matter what he tried to do to bring peace to his life, you know, obviously the way he's trying to bring peace to his life 
was doing what? He was doing it according to the flesh or what the flesh satisfied. He was following the things of this world, so he's not going to find any comfort in these things. But the thing is, is obviously, if you go according, you know, we walk, as the Bible says, according to the spirit of how God would have us to do, then we will find contentment. We will find comfort, right? And so, he's basically coming out in this verse, verse saying, I don't like how the world is. That's all he's saying. He said, you know what? I don't like how the world is. He didn't like the fact that he's working and that he's accumulating all this wealth, but in the end, he has to leave it behind with someone else. He's like, I'm doing all this work. I'm accumulating all this wealth. I, I don't have any you know, needs. I, I get to do this. And you know what? When it, all comes to, you know, when it all comes down to it, in the end, I'm not going to get to enjoy it because somebody else, you know, my son or you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the children that he has are going to enjoy it and not me. Or somebody else's that's going to come along. Somebody else is going to enjoy all of my labor. It's kind of like I think, you know, like with Doc. Doc goes over, Doc and Anthony go over, you know, to fix up these houses. They don't get to enjoy the labor of, you know, the fruits of their labor. They get to do the labor. And then somebody else gets to rent it and then get, gets to enjoy all their work. It's kind of like, you know, that's what he's going through in this. But here, I'm here to tell you that the world is not a fair place. It's not fair. There's a lot of times where we see things happen in this world and you go, that's not fair. Well, I'm not trying to be pessimistic or anything else. I'm just saying that life is not fair. God's word, I, I, you know, like I said, is one of the reasons why I love it so much because it doesn't candy coat things. It tells you like it is. When somebody is wicked and whatever, he tells you. When you know, somebody is a you know, man for God's own heart, it tells you. You know, you know, it goes out there and it, it, it will tell you what people will do. Why? Because we've already seen in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. They may rename it. That's why you see from all these different cults and different false religions, is the fact is, is that it's the same stuff that they've been doing since the world began. All they do is they give it a new name. All they do, that's all they do. Because if they were to call it, hey, why don't you come over you know, and, and worship Satan with me? You're not going to go. So they call it something else. You know, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. They put a new name. They always put a new title on something or whatever. I'm not saying just about Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, there's a lot of other false religions out there, like Buddhism and everything else. In which you find out with Buddhism, that's a fun one, too. I'll talk about that one in some ways. That's, that's a whole whole messed up, you know, because if you, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just go into this thought, because I had this thought this past week. This is a side note. This is my, hopefully one rabbit trail that I have this point. Is this. Buddhism, obviously, they believe in, uh, you know, reincarnation. So they're hoping that they get reincarnated as something that's considered to be a, a greater creature. Like I saw a, uh, a video where this person wanted to come back as a whale because it's considered to be a high honor of something of such majestic majesty. They want to come back as a whale. They have a problem with the Bible. Why? Because, you know, uh, because if you talk to them, you say, well, Jesus Christ raised from the dead. They say, that's the problem. The problem is that Jesus Christ didn't come back as another animal, didn't come back as another being, or didn't, you know, uh, you know go to the highest form, which is turn back into energy, into the universe. This is the Buddhist saying that. He came back as just, he, everybody knew he was Jesus. They said, that's the problem. And so they would go on this whole thing. So in their mind, is, is that a person whose soul can be reincarnated, so say you're a guy, and you get reincarnated, and you come back as another human. You can go, you know, come back into it, you know, be reincarnated as another human, that's a woman. And so then, you know, in your spirit, you feel like you're, what, a guy that's trapped in a woman's body. So do you see where some of this weird stuff is coming? And does it kind of go along with some of the weird stuff that we're going on now? And I was going, man, that's so cool. You know, that's, you, you understand where all this stuff is now because you got like the ones that are calling themselves trans transgender, transvestite, you know, basically whatever. And they're saying, well, I feel like whatever, I'm trapped, or you have the ones that say, I saw this one the other day. I just, I, I, I just need to pass it up and not click on it, because it's just stupidity for something. There was one where this one, she began to do different cat calls. 
I'm not cat, like cat calls like at a construction site. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about literal cat calls. And she goes, well, this is what this means. And she's over there meowing and doing all these other things. Because you know why? Because she believes that, you know, that she's really a cat trapped in a woman's body. So you have this whole thing, and you begin to realize where it's coming from. It's coming from like this whole Buddhist mindset that they're trying to bring into this whole thing that we're all these things. And you know, like I said, the whole thing is is that the highest form of Buddhism is that you can turn into energy and you get to go back into the universe. That's the highest form. So basically, you're just like nothing. I'm like, man, that sounds so hopeful. It doesn't. But um, so that's you know my, my little side rant, my rabbit trail for the day is just wow. I mean, that's just. It just amazes me, you know, that people will go that far. So, he finds no comfort. He doesn't expect this world, you know, if we want, you know, to expect the world to be fair, sorry, it's not going to be fair. Life is not going to. People are, you know, and here's the thing is, is that oftentimes what people will say is that people will get, you know, they'll get thrown off in their, in their mindset and, and their ideas is the fact that they see good people suffering while bad people prosper. They get thrown for a loop. They're like, well, this person's good. Why do they have all these issues? Why do they have all these problems? We live in a fallen and a wicked world. Life isn't fair. And you know what? I should have just said it this way, that the bad people are, are prospering. Because we have a bad idea, you know, in, in America and across the world, we have this bad idea of what uh, prospering is. We always think it has to be financial. All this guy's making millions of dollars or billions, I mean, you know, millions is not anything. You know, I mean, that's nothing nowadays. Millions, psh, you gotta be making billions or trillions. I mean, come on now. And they just keep on going on this whole thing. But it's like if you're not successful, I mean, you're definitely not successful if you're not making a couple million. I mean, you what? You only make you know thirty, fifty thousand a year. Oh my goodness, how do you live? How do you survive? Well, that's how the rest of the world is. And actually, obviously, the rest of the world actually even makes you know uh, in other countries makes less than that. But you have these, you know, the people out there that say, well, you're not successful in me, unless you're making a couple million. Well, what about the rest of everybody else? And I'll get into that here in, in a moment. But so as believers, we know that by faith that God's going to settle in the end. We know that this is not the end for us. That success is not defined by how much money you have. Success is defined, you know, how God's word says it is. In fact, for one thing, that you're saved, right? That's a big success. The next success is that you're bringing people to Christ, that's a success, and that your, 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 your whole life is about, not about, hey, this is my job and I must do it. The fact is that you want to bring more people to Christ, whether that's at work, or whether you're out, or all those different things. That's how God measures your success. Is that, are you, are you trying you know, to follow God's word? I say trying because I know that we will sin, that we will mess up, but what do we do when we sin? We, we need to come to him asking you know, forgiveness and say, you know, and, and uh, you know, and try to not do that again, right? We need to repent or turn from that. That will, uh, that what we're doing. But that's how God defines success. God finds defines the success is that you're trying to follow His word. If you're trying to do, you know, one thing number one is being, you know, is being saved. You've got to be saved. Two, seeing others saved, you know, and, and following God's word. That's about how God defines it. the world. Will look at it as like. God's going to take care of his own. The Bible says that he is going to take care of uh, his own. And like I said, we live in, and this is the you know, we, we live in America. Not that part. You guys, hopefully you guys know that you live in America. We need to realize this. In the world being, you know, in the world being unfair. We think unfair in America is because we didn't get our favorite dinner. That we have to eat something that way that we don't like. Or maybe that we don't prefer. And we have all these choices all around. We have all this fast food. While the world goes on and says, you know what, I wish I had dinner. I wish I had something to eat. So we need to realize that when we say, oh, that's so unfair, that's so unfair, it is not unfair. You know, just because, you know, for the longest time, and I eat them now. The longest time, I, I would reject tomatoes. I like ketchup. I like tomato sauce. I like spaghetti sauce. I, like, I just don't like tomatoes. But one of the things I had to realize 
If it's before me and somebody says, hey, would you try this? I need to do it. Why? Just because of it. I need to be thankful that I have that before me. You know, we went over to some Mexican restaurant one week and this guy goes, hey, do you want to try some trip? We're like, trip? What's that? And we were trying to figure it out because, you know, sometimes, you know, whatever, we'll go back and forth, like, oh, you need to try it. It's deep fried. Well, that ain't deep fried, right? Yeah, it's probably a good thing. And so he comes over, and we find out what it is. I, I type it into, you know, I have a translate app on my phone. Because, you know what, I, I live in America, and, you know, I don't have, I, I don't have a music stuff the phone, you know, so well with me. <coughs> and I look at it. Do you, you guys know what trip it is? Yeah, it is. She's like, oh, yeah. It's basically, it's, 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 like, uh, it's like intestines, right? It's intestines. And he goes, no, he wants to do it. Oh, it's so delicious. It's good. And he comes out and he brings it to us. What are you going to do? This guy says it's good. You're not going to offend someone. So I'm going to make it. Actually, it didn't taste like that bad. Like I said, it was deep fried, so automatically it's, just, it's better when it's deep fried. But, you know, it's those little things that we need to realize, you know, oftentimes we say, oh, man, it's not fair. It took me, you know, it took me two hours and you know, 30 minutes to get to a place. And normally it takes me two hours and 15 minutes. And that guy would have got. We need to realize that, you know, that it's not going to be that way. You know, we're not going to, you know, it's the fact that we need to also look at how other people in the world are. You know, we need to realize, hey, if we have a roof over our head, we have food on the table, and everybody's healthy, that's a good thing. Amen? Because I remember us going, my wife and I going to a, on a trip to Guatemala. And you get, you know, the place we're staying at, you know, it was like, you know, the place we're staying at was a place where a missionary was. It was basically like a concrete, like kind of like, it was almost like a bunker, but it was definitely different areas in there that you can kind of stay. And it was, you know, there was you know, some beds and everything else, and it wasn't anything, obviously anything fancy. But that was like the Ritz Carlton compared to a lot of places that we went to. When you go, and the fact that you're going to this house, and this house is kind of put together to, you know, with whatever they can find, just so they don't get wet, you kind of get me a little more grateful. And then you go, and then we went to a place where people were literally living on a garbage heap and would run, would run when the fresh garbage came in. Because that's the good stuff. Because that's where all the fresh food is. It's not quite spoiled yet. And you got kids running. And there's a big you know, pile of, you know, of, of, of feces off the side because that's their bathroom. Then you go, you come back to America and go, man, I'm spoiled, bro. I am so spoiled in the thing. And they would consider that to be success. Why? Because they had food. They had shelter. And so we need to you know, begin to you know, realize, and like I say, obviously Solomon is you know, you know, probably not thinking that way because he's a king. And he's not, you know, uh, and so like in this area where he's going, oh, life is not fair. It just, you know, it's just, it's just means in this area. Because you know what? And he's beginning to realize, he's beginning to see that you know what, the way he's defining success is not the way that God defines success. Number two is, he thinks that it's better to be dead than alive. This is like this, the emotional state that he's in, or this is the state. This is the reason why I say you either find scripture with scripture, because we would say, no, you know, God created us for a purpose. It's not better to be dead than alive. We need to do things. But he's he's at this point. So in verses two and three, we're gonna see this. It says in verse 2, it says, Wherefore, I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than living, which are yet alive. Solomon thinks, like I said, that it is better to be dead, that it is better to be dead than rather than to be alive as well. Verse uh, 3, Yea, better is he that both they which have not uh, yet been, uh, who has uh, not uh, seen the evil work that is done under the sun. So he goes on even in to further in this. He says, you know, it would have been better if I would have been a miscarriage. That's what he's saying right here. He says, that if I would not have been. That basically, if I would have been a miscarriage, I, mean, I could have just not even experienced this world. I could have just gone off into heaven. That's what, you know, this is where Solomon's mindset is. He said, I would rather have been a miscarriage than to, you know, see the evil things in this world, to, to see all this stuff. I would, you know, that way I'm able to just go on and, 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 and go you know, into heaven as well. And Solomon actually comes to the same conclusion as Job does. Job came to that same conclusion. He thought that it would have been better 
Um, if you uh, would have been in this church as well. Job chapter 3, verse 11 says this. Is, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? He is, you know, flat out saying, it would have been better if I would have just died in the womb. If I would have just been a stillborn. If I would have just been, you know, a miscarriage. In Ecclesiastes, he goes on, he's going to he's continue this thought. In Ecclesiastes 6, we see this in verse 3, it says, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. He continues this whole idea that he thinks that it would have been better if he would have never had it. But eventually, obviously, he's, getting, he, he's going to start getting some stuff right. He's in this area where he's reflecting upon all the things that he's been a part of, that he's seen, that he's done, and he's, you know, he's realizing it was all vanity, it was all meaningless, it was all of those things. And so, He's having to work some stuff out in his mind as he goes. And so obviously we know that this is the wrong mindset for a man because we know that children are a reward and an inheritance. God knew what he was doing when he put us here. He knew what he was doing. He didn't make a mistake. That's also a big problem with that whole mindset of the, the woman trapped in a man's body and all that kind of stuff is because they feel like God got it wrong. That's what they'll say. Well, God didn't do it wrong. No, God didn't mess up when he made you male, when he made you female. He didn't mess up and go, oops, God got by me. Man, I should have done better on that one. No, God says, you know what, I put you here for a reason. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He made you male, female, and that's it. And so, when he realized, you know, he's like, don't, don't lament your life. Don't be pessimistic. There's always, you know, a person that will come around and, you know, and it's one thing, you know, you, sometimes you get into that, that funk, you know, where you're just kind of like, you're, you're just in a bad mood. But don't stay there. Because there's some people, like, no matter what you say to them, it's like, they are going to sit there and just be mad or angry or just, you say, it's a great day. Well, it's a little cloudy. I mean, just always look into the bad side of things. Or it hasn't rained in a while. I mean, or just whatever. Well, it rained like three feet in like, the well, last you know, a couple of years. Just everything about them, no matter what you say to them. It's just like, when I meet somebody like that, I'm like, it was good talking to you. I'll see you later. You know, and you just met them. And you just want to get out of that, you know, that conversation because you're like, no, no matter what I say to you, no matter how I try to cheer you up, or maybe, you, or, you know, the fact that I am not in that mood, no matter what I say, you're going to be mad. You're going to be you know, frustrated. You know, frustrated with that. And the thing is, is that God, like I said before, God has put you here for a reason. God has put you for, uh, as um, as Esther says, for such a time as this. For such a time as this, that's the reason why God put you here. He don't want you in the 1800s. He don't want you in you know uh, in the time of Christ. I know people say, well, I was just born in the time of Christ. I couldn't talk to Jesus. God put you here for a purpose and for a reason. He doesn't want you. If he wanted you back in the Bible times, he would have put you there. But he says, you know, I'm going to use you now, here today, at the time that I've appointed for you to be here. Amen? Number three, people will hate you when you are successful. I mean, I, you know, there's people that will sit there and say, you know what, uh, you know, I'm going to be so glad, you know, when you finally make it, you know, when you get it. And then when you make it, they're not, they're not happy with it. When I say make it like you, you, uh, you're doing what you feel like I would have me for you to do. I, I know that like, I personally, and I know that obviously Ms. Brenda and all them are going to be happy when Charlotte becomes a nurse. She's going for that right now. I will truly be I'm not going to be one of those. How dare you become a nurse? Or when, you know, when Abby goes on and you know, she goes on to computer, computers and be like, oh yeah, must be nice. You have those people in your life that will sit there and say that they want this or whatever for you, but all of a sudden you do it and they're like, oh, it must be nice. You know, it seems like you got all this money. What are you doing with it? I'll get into that idea here in a moment. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 4, verse 4 says, Again, I considered all surveil and every uh, right work that for uh, this a man is envy of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. By the way, vexation of spirit just means that he's, you know, this is irritating those things. So we see this with Solomon that he's just basically saying there's vexation of spirit. He goes, I'm really, uh, you know, this is irritating us. All these things that are going on in my life. And so Solomon is bringing, bringing more things in to his, you know, into this conversation that bothers him. 
And he said, you know what? That even when I was successful in living a life that people resented me, people were envious of me. Like I said, people will hate you when you're successful. And it's not just financial. When you do the, you know what God has called you to do, when God says, you know what, hey, you look, and you finally, it's something that you've always talked about doing, and you're finally doing it, they'll get mad at you. Why? Because they're not doing it. They're, they're not where they're supposed to be. And so they try to you know, bring it down on you because they're mad at themselves for not accomplishing what they want to do or what they dream of doing. So they're going to you know, try and get you, you know, uh, down that way. Let's look at, let's connect these verses because we're going to begin to see that all these verses are going to connect you. Verses 4 and 5 says, again, I, uh, I consider all Shabbat and every way, well, every work word that for this man is envy of his neighbor. This is also added to the invitation of the Spirit. The fool folded his hands together and eat of his own flesh. You see, that sounds disgusting. This is one of those parts where you need to realize one thing is using that you know, allegorically, but it's also saying that um, if you look at not only Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the foolish man or the fool is often known as the lazy man. They're usually, uh, you know, more times than not, is used synonymously. When you see the word fool, it talks about being lazy. When you see a lazy man talk about it, it's talking about the fool. I mean, it goes back and forth. So in this context, what he's talking about is the fool envies the successful person. The fool's going to envy somebody that is successful. And uh, the folding of the hands is a picture of the fool not doing anything. They're refusing to work. And so, when you, you know, they talk about the folding of the hands is a person refusing to actually do work to provide for themselves. And so they're going to sit there and, and be envious of the person that's working out, they're working and doing things with their life. So like I said, you know, that's a picture of that they're not working, not, they're not willing to provide for themselves, and they're not and they're, they're basically, you know, coming out and they're, you know, they, they just kind of envy those that are hard working in this fact. And they'll sit there and go, you go out and say you buy like a brand new one. And they'll come out and say, well, that's the nice. You come out and you get a, a new car. You say it's like a, I'm trying to believe it or something that's like, not this. I have a, I'm going to say a Chevy Cavalier, but they don't make Cavaliers anymore. The Honda Accord, and they'll say, well, it must be nice that you, you, know, that you, you could buy this brand new car. All the while, while they're sitting at home and doing nothing. Oh, it must be nice when you, you know, you're able to, and they just go on and on, and they have this idea of what it is. And this has began to, to take a, you know, shape you know, for the younger generation, because the way that the media it makes it is that capitalism, uh, capitalism is evil, right? All those capitalist pigs, that's all they are. Socialism is the way to go. I've even heard people use the Bible to say that Bi the Bible promotes socialism. And they'll go to, you know, the book of Acts. They say, well, right here it says that, you know, that they all put all their stuff together and, they're, and they gave to whoever wanted need, you know, had needs. That's socialism. Everybody's on the equal playing field. And I was like, no, it's not. The part you're missing in here is the fact that, is this. Socialism says that everybody's on the same plane, right? So whether you're a hardworking person or you're a lazy person, you get the same pay. And the government gets all the money. In this story in the book of Acts, is the fact that these people, yes, they have money and they all put it together so that way there was no one in need. But you know what? You know who got to choose what they gave? The people did. The people said, you know what? I'm going to give so somebody else doesn't have me. What the government wants to do is say, I'm going to take all your money. You guys all made the same whether you work harder or you're lazy, but we get all the money. That's the difference. Capitalism says that if you work hard, you can, you can give yourself a good life. That you, you know, that you're able to buy a house, that you're able to, you know, get a car, that you're able to provide for your family. It may not be the best, it may not be a Mercedes Benz, it may not be a mansion, but it's, you have something to provide for your family. You're able to buy food for your family. That's what capitalism says, that if you work hard, you're going to be able to provide. Socialism says that whatever the government says, that's what you're going to get. And that's what they don't promote on mainstream media. They want to promote, so, oh, socialism sounds so great because everybody is equal. All these people that have all this money, 
And I'm not saying that you can't corrupt you know, uh, you know, a, a way of thinking, like in capitalism. I think there is corruption in capitalism. But the basic premise of capitalism says that if you work hard, you're going to be able to provide for your family. You're going to be able to provide, be able to do the things you want to do. Socialism says we don't care how, how hard you work. We don't care, care how busy you, um, you work. You're just going to get paid the same, and we're going to get all the money. We're going to reap all the benefits. So I just want to set you know that you know, you know straight because they don't tell you that other part. They, they, they'll point to all these other people that have made billions and trillions of dollars, and those are usually the ones, honestly, that are the corrupt capitalists, the ones that make billions and trillions of dollars because they're making it up to somebody else. Not always, but you know, most of the time. And like I said, you know, for us, we need to realize in this. Watch out for when you see somebody get something else new or whatever, watch out for that thought that might come, from your, come by your mind and go, that's the nice. I wish I had that. Because the Bible tells us that we are not to covet or wish that it was ours, but somebody else has. The Bible even goes as far as to say, you know, that you should not wish for your neighbor's wife or that you should covet your neighbor's wife. What does that mean? That you want the neighbor's wife. Don't do it. Just because, you know what, if somebody's able to do it, they've been working hard at it, that's the thing that we need to realize is that, well, for one thing, I not there. But also, what we may need to realize is that we may not see all the hard work that they did in order to get that. That's what we need to realize. That's what, how we need to, to look at it is this person may have put in a lot of hard work to be able to reach that point, and that's why they're able to get this. But here's the other thing. God's word promises that if we work hard as a Christian, that God will bless us. I think oftentimes we look at the world's success and think that that's successful. But God's word says that if you work hard as a believer, he will bless you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 25 says this. It says, And whatsoever uh, you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord... Uh, you, shall, uh, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that uh, doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong that, of which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. God doesn't risk, you know, play favorites in Christianity. He says, if you're working hard, you know what, I'm going to bless you for that, why? Because you're doing it as unto the Lord. If you're being lazy, I'm not going to bless, I'm going to give you what you get. And you don't work it. All right. Verse, uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 8, says this, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any, uh, any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, which, uh, whether he is uh, he be bond or free. He's saying whether you're a slave or not. He says, you know what? You do it on earth, uh, unto the Lord, you do a good thing. He says, you're going to receive the same back from the Lord. God's going to give you the same thing back. Now I want to take you know, uh, verse 4 and 5, and I'm going to put it with 6, because then we're going to be able to begin to see a little bit more on this. Verse 4 says, and again, I uh, consider all your will. And every, uh, and every right word that for uh, uh, this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The, the fool holds his, uh, his hand together and he is his own flesh. Better is a uh, handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation. All these verses actually go together. They, 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 we read together. So, as it being. Uh, both, both hands being full isn't a good thing because he has too much in which leads to stress. Oftentimes you find those people that have all these things in life that they that they have no need of anything, that they have the money, they have all that everything they need, they don't sleep well. Because they have all this stuff. They're always worried about this. They're like worried about their portfolio. If that's even you know, still around, I don't know. But they're worried about all those things that are going on in their life, all these different areas that they're doing and making sure that that's going, that they don't sleep. I mean, there's a reason why you'll hear about different people that are rich that don't sleep that much. Because they don't sleep well. I mean, the Bible even says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, which we'll uh, do next week, in verse 12, it says, the sleeping of a laboring man is sweet, whether he, uh, he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will, suffer, will not suffer him to sleep. He said, you know what? They have all that stuff on their mind. They're not going to be able to sleep well. But you know what? When you work hard and you're doing those things, 
whether you have a lot or a little, you're going to be able to see well, why? Because you're laboring, you're doing the things, you're doing an honest day's work. Now look at it this way, is that the middle road is better. I don't want to be rich, and I don't want to be poor. I just kind of want to be in that middle room. I just, I, I don't want, you know, if it's rich, you're not going to sleep, and then you're poor, you're not going to have nothing to eat. I just want to be there, and I believe that God, that's where God you know, has a lot of you know, believers in that area. And the thing is, is what does he say? He says, it's better to have one handful, one hand of quietness than to have both hands full with all kinds of other stuff going on. With all these things going on. Proverbs 30, verse 8 says, Remove far off from me vanities and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food convenient for me. What is he telling us? He says, he says, I don't want to be poor and I don't want to be rich. But just give me what I need. That's all I do. That's all that matters. Give me that you know But we know this because you know what? God's going to give us what we need. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He does supply for everything that we need. Not that we want, but that we need. For life. Number four, it's better to not be alone. It's better to not be alone. Listen to verses, eight, uh, verses 7 and 8. Then I returned and saw a vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath uh, neither a uh, child nor brother, yet is there no end of his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither uh, saith he, for whom uh, do I labor and bereave my, uh, my soul of good. This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. These are people, there are people out there that have all the money in the world, and yet they're all alone. There's nobody around them. They don't have a brother. They don't have family. They don't have friends. Why? Because they made their life's purpose to do what? To make money. And they shunned everybody else or the fact is that there's nobody else around them. They spent their whole life accumulating that wealth because they thought that that's what defined it being a success. And like I said, Solomon is explaining how all of life is a vain, that is vain, is vain, you know, apart from Christ. When he goes through this and he's talking about everything is vanity, everything is vain, everything is empty apart from Christ. He even talks to me you know, that it's like chasing after the wind. You ever try to chase after the wind? You can't catch it. Why? Because you know it's windy and you're not. All right. But that's the whole thing is, is that he's going on, he's explaining that part, is the fact that he's tried pretty much everything that there is. And apart from your relationship with the Lord, everything is meaningless. Everything is. You say, well, Pastor, did you say that last week? I said, yes. And that's what Solomon is going to continue to do, or to emphasize. And some people say, well, you know what? Well, what about this? I do this. What is that? And I say, hey. This is a man that did it. This is later on in his life. He's lived it. He's realized it. He goes, it's all man. And that's usually what happens when you start getting you know, older. I mean, much older than anybody in this room. Um, you start beginning to realize that all the stuff that you have chased for and everything else, you go, man. I, I mean, even I'm 45. I guess you know, you know, being near. I don't know if somebody said that being like my midlife crisis. I, I hope that I live beyond 90. And, you know, everything else. I, I pray that I'm still you know, preaching the gospel, you know, at 90 plus. But um, we need to, you know, uh, you know, the people will, you know, begin to, you know, go through all these things and. and get our older on and as they begin to sit down they begin to think this is all everything I was the ones that have done it wrong must have been good. I didn't do it. I mean think about it. Have you ever met a person that said, I've had too many children? Most of us, I mean yeah you may see us you know that they may be angry at their kids and I had way too many kids. But they never regret having the kids. They regret the fact of having of having money and not having a family, right? I mean, that's, you know, and, you know, if you say, well, you know what, yeah, I've met some people, well, probably, they don't know the Lord. 
But everybody, you know, what I'm gonna do, most of the time what a person realizes and that they go through is the fact that they, they chased after things that didn't matter. They chased after all those things that didn't matter. I mean, you know, think about when you get older, are you gonna be able to like, man, with all the money I still have? Or the fact that oh man, I'm glad I, I still have my family. I have all these kids. And these kids need to still visit me. Usually the ones that despise the fact of having children is because of the fact that they've mistreated their children. And that their children don't visit them now. Let's look at verses 9 through 12. It says, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his pillow. But woe unto him that is alone when he falls. For he, uh, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then you have heat. But how can uh, one be warmed alone? And if one prevail against against him, two uh, uh, shall withstand him, and three cord, uh, three bull cord is not quickly broken. And what uh, we see from here is the fact that when you go out, like you know, just like put it this way, you know, like ladies, if you go out, is it safer for you to go out, you know, all by yourself? Or is it safe to have another person with you? It's safer to have them. And if you have three, that's even better, right? Because a person's not going to try and mess with somebody that has, uh, you know, has friends. Even if you're like, if you take a child with you, they're more likely to not go after you, even if you have like a five-year-old with you, as opposed to you go by yourself. That's what it's teaching here is the fact that, you know what, that it's better to have people around you. Like, what does it say here? It says, it's, you know, that if the one person falls, then there's a person to help them back up. But if you fall and there's nobody around, I mean, there's a reason why they have those life alert things on there saying, no, oh, I've fallen. And I can't get up. There's nobody there to help them. And so that's, you know, what he's putting on there is the fact that, you know, especially like if you're going out or anything like that, you're going to have other people with you. Don't go alone. Because why? Because you can get yourself in trouble. The people, you know, people in, in, you know, and relationships in our lives are more important than things. The people and relationships we have is more important than the things that we have. I know that the iPhone 15 just came out. Surprise, because again, for a few years, I didn't hear anything because I had to stay away from it, but then I just kind of got put back out there. People go, I gotta have it. I mean, did you see the cameras? No, you don't have any. Here's one of the things. For the iPhone 15, whatever's gonna come out. Yes, I know the phones all have cameras on them, but you know what's better to be? To be in the moment. Because just by you taking that picture, you know, I'm not saying that you can't take any pictures of you, you whatever. You can take a picture. But don't be I've seen people out there and they're all like just taking whatever and like, yeah, do this again. It's not even like what's actually happening that day. It's the fact that they're like setting up and looking so they can look back on it later on. Like, wasn't that such a, such a wonderful day? I mean, look at all the fun that you had. And the entire time they were setting up things. Try to do that at the zoo and try to go up to a lion and say, okay, lion, now you, a lion ain't going to do anything for you. But it's better to, you know, uh, you know, to have people in those relationships in our lives. They're more important than things. No one wants to be the guy in mercy. No one wants to be alone. There's a reason why there's a lot of people, you know, that when they get older, if they're by themselves, they want to get remarried. They don't want to get alone. And I'm not saying that if you're living by yourself, or, you know, whatever, I'm saying don't shut yourself off to other people. Because there's that thing too, that people, you know, they'll get older and be like, ah, I don't care. I don't care if I'm alone, and they're that crotchety old man. And every time you talk to them, get off my lawn, and they have nothing else to do in life. You know, it's like if they had a Facebook account, they'd just be like, you know, like mad at everybody. Ah, get away from me! I just hold that lawn, what are you doing? You know, just, it's like, you know what? Just, you know, have people don't be you know, alone. Be, be around people. That's what's you know, why it's so good to you know, to be to have church families. Because you're not alone. Whereas you may not have a physical family around you, or you know that you can call somebody up from your church family and be like, "Hey, you want to go do something?" Like, yeah, you know, and they're out, you know, doing something, having lunch together. It's always you know, a good way to be. But like I say, people is more important than stuff. You have people. I mean, I see houses around Carothersville, and you there's you. Not even just in Carrozzo, but you're going to think of a house as soon as I say this. 
that has all the junk that you could possibly think in that front yard everywhere. They're a hoarder. Have all that stuff. And what do they do with it? Nothing, because it just sits there. And you, I guarantee you that house probably has mice in it. Why? Because they're all hiding in your junk. And people like look at that and go, I gotta have this because you never know what I'm gonna need it. I can guarantee you, but I have about 95% of that stuff that you have around your yard or in your attic or in your basement that you've like accumulated as being a hoarder, you're not gonna use. Ever. That's why, like, well, you know, when I got rid of, like, my parents, like, kept all my, my childhood toys. All of them. My wife said I was spoiled and I had to agree with them. There's a lot of things that I had. And, and you know, they kept it. They, they didn't want to get rid of it because, you know, they said, well, it's your stuff. It's not ours. We wanted you to get rid of it. And honestly, I got rid of it. I had all this stuff. I'm like, what am I going to do with, like, you know, all this Star Wars and, Transformers and Indiana Jones and G.I. Jones. This is all the toys that I had when I was a kid. Yeah. Pretty awesome, though, because I sold all my uh, Star Wars and stuff like that and got like $1,000 for it. I was like, woo It wouldn't do me any good. I'm not going to sit out there, you know, in the game room and I'm like, okay, Vader. Uh, all right, John Vader. Go get Luke. Take his hand and You know, I'm not going to do that. Just stuff. I wanted to use that for something, you know, that actually that I could use, not some person that's going to sit in a box. When we look at verse 10, you know, it's, you know, we can talk about the fact that there's nobody else with you and the else, but here's the other thing is that people will oftentimes say, I can be a lone wolf. I don't need church. I don't need a church to be saved. I don't need a, you know, any, you know, whatever. I can just do it. On. I have my Bible. I can read it. I can do whatever. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to make the effort. I can just sit at home, watch it on YouTube or Facebook, all those things. I don't need anybody. But here's the problem with that. For one, I'm going to just tell you, don't be a lone wolf. Don't sit at home and, and whatever. Get, you know, be a part of the local church. Because you know what happens when you, uh, when you stay in the church and you you're not in that fellowship when there's no ironing, sharpening iron, you become spiritually cold. You become spiritually cold. And usually what happens is that a lot of people become bitter and angry. Because the thing is, is the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembly. And the thing is, you know what you're supposed to do, and you don't do it, and then you you become bitter and everything else towards everybody else. And, and, and it's, you know, you're like, well, I wish that I was just like, you know, so-and-so. Or I wish or whatever. And then, and then they become bitter and angry. And then they start getting mad when other people are growing. When people are growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, a person that is backslidden, that is, you know, spiritually cold, is going to get angry with those that are, you know, growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. They will. Why? Because it's they know what to do, but they're not doing it. And they're not going to take it out on themselves. They're not going to get mad at themselves. They're going to get mad at you. And that's what oftentimes happens. I mean, let's look at it even biblically. What happens to King Saul? King Saul, chosen of God. He's the king that God wants. He, does, he begins to do all the things that God wants. Has a great time. Everybody's all afraid of Saul. Saul begins to do what? He begins to, you know, backslide. He begins to get spiritually cold. And then what God says, you know what? I'm done with Saul. He's not going to be my king anymore. I'm going to get somebody else. And he gets King David. King uh, Saul knows that David is going to be king. And he's mad because he's not in the place where he should be. That God basically you know, took away, you know, him being king. And he gets mad and he gets frustrated. And he, I mean, not even... I mean, mad and frustrated is, 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 is being nice. I mean, my wife has been mad and frustrated with me, but she's never thrown spears at me. Praise the Lord. I mean, he goes out and he's just mad. He's just throwing spears at him. And he's like, what did David do? David didn't do anything. David actually takes the high road 
And then she says, you know, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. Because he knew that his time hadn't come yet. But the thing is, is that David stays back, and he keeps on saying, you know, all the nice things about him, because he knows that, that he's, that, you know, he's all the same, you know, that he's having some issues. But he, he continues to just say all, you know, these things about him, and he is saddened when Saul dies. But Saul the entire time is just mad at him. Not because of what King David did, it's because of what King Saul didn't do. And that's the same way that we can get it. That if we don't you know, want to go to the local church, we can say, I can just do it on my own. I don't need anybody. You know, I can learn all that I want to learn. One thing, the Bible says that, you know what, that you should not be coming to any uh, conclusions of Scripture by private interpretation. Which basically says, you know what, it needs to be public that people, you, know, you need to be at a church. Because that's also where you get some weird, you know, weird thoughts. Hey, I was reading the Bible later and it told me I could be an alien. No, it didn't. You know, that's where you know, they come up with these things. But that's why uh, we need to, you know, that's why I'm thankful that, you know, uh, you know, here this morning that you, you came to church. You didn't say, well, I'm just going to catch it on Facebook. I'm just going to catch it on YouTube. But you came and you said, you know what, I want to grow up in those. I'm, I was, I'm glad to see all those that were in Sunday school this morning with Brother Doug. Because they're saying, you know what, we need to grow. We, you know, iron sharpens iron, right? And I think about the fact, going back to the strength in numbers part of it. You ever watch those uh, nature documentaries? You always see the big, you know, herd of gazelles. Who gets taken on first, you know, when the lions come? The lone gazelle that deviates from the group. He doesn't attack the entire, you know, herd. He goes after the one. And that's where Satan will come in because, you know what, he comes as a warring lion seeking whom he may devour. If he can get you by yourself, he gets a tasty snack. And he can just mess with you all that he wants. Last part of this, I'm going to just wait. I know that I'm going to Verse 13 and 14 says, uh, Better it is a, a poor and a wise a child uh, than an old and foolish king who uh, will no more be admonished. For out of prison he comes to the reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becomes poor. In other words, a person that, that will not be admonished is the person that doesn't want to learn anymore, that doesn't want to be instructed anymore. And so what he's saying is, is the fact that it is better to learn from an eight-year-old than from a person that doesn't want to learn anymore. You should always be learning. You should always be, you know, uh, you know, reading more of the Bible, you know, memorizing, doing all those things. You should always, you should never get to the point to where you say, you know what, I, I get the pinnacle. I'm on the mountain summit. I'm good because I'll, that's going to lead you, you know, to being cold as well. You know, you know so the Lord, you know, so because you're not wanting to learn anything new. And so he goes on to say that. Uh, with this, and the overall conclusion is that we live in a fallen world, fallen wicked world, and there will be times where we don't understand what's going on. Because this is not a perfect world. But for the believer in Jesus Christ, there's one waiting for us, right? There's a perfect world waiting for us. And one day we shall see it. But remember, while we live in this life, it's not fair. Amen? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that your word is so honest and, and, and so true, Lord, that when we think that we uh, we got all that figured out, then something else happens. And Lord, when we realize that your word tells us the truth 100% of the time, that it will show us that life is not fair. But we know that, you know, that this life is not the life that we're living for. Lord, we are living for the next life. God, we thank you, God, that you've given us eternal life through the free gift of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. One last thing. Tonight, 5 o'clock, uh, we have First Youth and we have a prayer meeting at 5. And then uh, Wednesday night, we have our, uh, our Bible study starting at 6.30. God bless you. You are dismissed.